With the impeachment inquiries of Donald Trump fresh in my mind, I began to think about how we got to this point. No, not how President Trump got to where he is, but how we as a nation got to this point. Roll call after roll call vote along party lines. How is it that not one Democrat or one Republican voted out of step? How is it that it seems one party is trying to uphold the values of the Constitution while the other is trying to frame it to nullify the 2016 election? How can the facts laid out in front of both parties be interpreted so differently? At one point in time, the Constitution was this beacon of light which directed our representatives towards some objective way to govern. Now it's become this bludgeon when it suits one party over the other, a rally cry of moral superiority instead of a guiding hand to protect the people from abuses of government. I fear that after 200 years, we are starting to feel the effects of having market influences under capitalism coupled with a democratic electoral system. That truth and facts no longer drive our politicians, but the hand of the free market. The Invisible Hand From my research, I've concluded that the invisible hand is actually quite visible. According to Investopedia, the invisible hand is a metaphor for the unseen forces that move the free market economy. Through individual self-interest and freedom of production as well as consumption, the best interest of society is fulfilled. The constant interplay of individual pressures on market supply and demand causes the natural movement of prices and the flow of trade. We know what causes markets to shift and change. The marketing and advertising industry rely heavily on theories developed from social and behavioral science. A field of research in which they know exactly where to place a product on the shelf, how to create the print on the box, and the exact price point to compel a consumer to buy. Therefore, shelf space located at or near eyesight is much more expensive to suppliers than being on the bottom row. Consumers are more than likely going to buy what is at eye level versus having to perform any labor, such as reaching down or picking up the product. This does not mean the product is better because it sells more. It just proves that consumption behavior is much more complex than we already admit. On top of that, what marketing and advertising can't achieve, attention can. Attention has become a huge currency in a market flooded with ideas and products. A simple example of this is the current market for attention when it comes to screens. TVs, mobile phones, and tablets are all competing against each other for screen time. The more screen time one product has, the higher probability that user will invest into the newest model with all the bells and whistles, or at least spend more of their money in that sub-market. This is one of the reasons why TVs are getting so big so fast. They are using the gimmick of size to attract more attention or screen time to their product. It is cheaper to increase the size instead of actual technology in the product. A 65 inch TV has the same number of pixels as a 45 inch TV. The 45 inch TV will generally have a better looking picture unless the 75 inch TV is an 8K. Then the pictures would be similar in quality. While competition is not necessarily a bad thing, since it does create technological advancements and provides cheaper products in some areas, I must point out that this competition for the attention, or at least eyes on the screen, of the consumer may not be good for the long term in society. It may be good for the profits of certain companies, but overall it pushes a medium for which people will consume information. I'll address this point later, but I just wanted to quickly lay that out first. Of course, consumer demand can cause markets to shift, and it is possible that markets are reacting to genuine demands of consumers. I say genuine here on purpose, and I'll get into my reasoning soon, but markets can also shift with the political winds. The stock market goes up and down based upon speculation and who's in power. Having a president who is anti-coal would provide an environment where coal markets react to this sentiment. Furthermore, it could increase investing into other energy producing sectors. This is where I'd like to posit a new term, the polyconomy. The polyconomy. The United States operates under a very complex and highly developed mixed economy. 
meaning that there are blended elements of market economies with elements of planned economies, free markets with state interventionism, or private enterprise with public enterprise. Our political arena is not shielded from the influence of these market forces, from the very elections that elect our representatives to the representatives themselves. The entire process has been exposed to the influences of the market. This, is not, this not only poses a problem to our representative democracy, but also to the will of the people. The entirety of the market and how it plays out and how it plays out the manufacturing of consent in politics is what I will now refer to as the polyconomy. See, the polyconomy is the entirety of market forces that influence not only elections, but policy making overall. See, propaganda is not only something governments are good at producing and disseminating, but also corporations. It seems that as advertising went from showing the differences between products to lifestyle branding, it started to intersect with the political. Don't get me wrong, politics concerns everything, but when corporations have become so powerful that they can outright advertise their products through promoting a lifestyle instead of the product itself, we've reached a new way of manufacturing consent. But most people on the right look at the government with angst because it seeks to regulate the behavior of business. Business is proxy for the individual in their minds. While businesses are filed under articles of incorporation and have special legal status, many still treat them as if they're reflections of these people that started them. They create this hypocritical viewpoint that separates the individual from the business legally, but socially they are still one and the same. They believe the notion that successful businesses started with this one person's idea. Through many trials and obstacles, that one person kept that business afloat. That one individual is the sole reason for its success. Not the workers who make the product and not society at large that produces a system for the company to prosper. So they see regulations as an attack on the individual and not the company as a legal entity. On the other hand, the right also views the company itself as an entity that just produces good. Good in the terms of product, services, profits, and jobs. If you produce products and services, people want and find satisfactory, that is good. If the company produces profit, that is good, despite whose pockets that profit ends up. If a company produces jobs, then an individual can feed their family and provide, which is good under our current system. The right promotes the company as the vehicle that produces good. If the company produced bad, then it wouldn't exist in their opinion. That includes sin-type companies like tobacco, alcohol, porn, and other similar industries. You know, I, I once thought that government worked with companies to produce propaganda solely. You can see this in how movies promote the American military to get subsidies, or how the Ad Council, a non-profit, non-governmental agency, helps disseminate public service announcements on behalf of various sponsors, one of them being multiple agencies of the United States government, or how the military uses psychological operations overseas but fails to offer any way of limiting those effects of the programs on domestic audiences. With new, the new trends in advertising and marketing, it seems that businesses may have found a way to influence the government more than the government can influence them. This is done through the polyconomy, businesses leading government. So how can a business influence the government? Well, one of the biggest and oldest means is directly contributing financially to a candidate. Funding a candidate's campaign and or political party does come with certain benefits. Say, for instance, a business wanted less regulation in order to increase their profit margins. Well, more than likely, all they would have to do is fund a Republican for the open seat or in the general or in general, the Republican Party. The Republican Party is small government, which deregulation falls under. President Trump's executive order stating that every new regulation enacted requires X number of old regulations to be removed is a prime example of how electing certain politicians can increase a company's bottom line. In politics, incumbents have a huge advantage and will more than likely beat any com anyone competing against them. However, while helping to put a new candidate in office may be expensive up front, incumbents become less expensive and more of a guarantee after they win. So businesses don't have to give as much to keep getting the same result year after year. 
On the other hand, an organization could just fund anti-political ads for challengers as well. This is what the NRA does since most, of, since most high power offices already align with their political agenda. They fund campaign ads against the political opponents of those they support. They drum up political propaganda that doesn't cost their incumbents any money at all. So even when the NRA isn't directly donating to these individuals, they are helping them through anti-political campaigns. Besides money, businesses can also influence politicians by helping to elect officials that will shrink the national budget and reduce overall taxation. By doing this, the government must cut certain budgets for offices and or not fund certain initiatives at all. One prime example of this is in the field of lobbying. The Congressional Research Service provides an extremely important service to Congress. It works exclusively for the United States Congress, providing policy and legal analysis to committees and members of both the House and Senate, regardless of party affiliation. CRS is well known for analysis that is authoritative, confidential, objective, and nonpartisan. Its highest priority is to ensure that Congress has 24-7 access to the nation's best thinking. However, if this service was so important, then it should be funded appropriately. I tried to do a search for a timeline of their budget, and it doesn't exist. So I created my own and will list the resources for this data in the, in the description below. From the last 10 years, the budget for the Congressional Research Service has been steady. It has only fluctuated about $10 million here and there. That sounds good, right? Except inflation over 10 years eats away a lot of the buying power. Acquiring talent is harder since the budget hasn't increased significantly to offer competitive salaries or hire outside experts. The Congressional Research Service helps keep Congress from being influenced by lobbyists. Where one fails, the other picks up. For example, members of Congress do not have the time to research and look up every bill that comes across their desk. They also don't have much time to offer their own bills to help them gain clout for re-election. Lobbyists come to their desk with already written legislation. The congressperson barely has to do any work and they can produce legislation under their name that gives the illusion that they're working hard writing legislation. The Congressional Research Service provides unbiased interpretation of bills for Congress so that they have the information to make better choices. Can you see how an underfunded service can promote the interest of private and business interests at the federal level? If we step away from federal government, you can see how business takes advantage of local government. I personally know of people who run for political positions only to gain an advantage in the market. Two examples. The first example is a local restaurant owner who wanted to open a location underneath a different name. They ran for a city council seat and won. While serving on the council, they had direct influence over the red tape surrounding the building of the new restaurant. Not only did his business receive thousands of dollars from taxpayers, but he also used his power to not pave the parking lot. Under city code, all parking lots must be paved and are required to be a certain size. He used his power on the council to circumvent this regulation, and they are the only restaurant with an unpaved parking lot. My second example is another business owner who ran for the local Roads and Bridges Commission. He owns a storage and moving company. He ran for one term and then got off the commission. He then proceeded to buy up all the land that was in the future development of the major highways. On this land, he threw some storage units on them so that when they came to buy the land from him, they would have to pay for the loss of income over time. He used his knowledge of future planning to steal taxpayers' money. The two examples above happen because it's incredibly difficult to keep an eye on every elective representative. It's almost impossible to know how every one person you vote for or those appointed from your elected representatives acts and always behaves. We put trust in those elected representatives to tr and trust in the system we have built to keep them within some moral guideline. With Donald Trump, we have seen how even the system itself can bend the moral pressures of a party. Everything the GOP once stood for, they have swayed on underneath Trump. Why? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it has something to do with power and personal identity. Branding. Under the poly economy, we have brands. Brands have taken many different forms. We have the branding of the parties, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Green, and the Constitution Party. 
Independent has gotten popular, but I believe this is just a facade to hide one from politically committing and facing the backlash of a party's brand. We also have ideological branding, liberal, progressive, conservative, constitutionalist, libertarian, etc. These further divide us along the political spectrum. Then, to make things even more complicated, individual voters also brand themselves. Their very identity becomes this lifestyle brand. We can see this in the Republican Party under Trump, where any change in policy nationally feels like an attack on their individual values and culture. Branding is the promotion of a product or company by means of advertising and distinctive design. Branding subverts principles needed for par perfect competition in a market. For perfect competition to exist, a certain set of market conditions must be prevalent in the market. These conditions include a large number of buyers and sellers, perfect information, homogeneous products, well-defined property rights, no barriers to entry or exit, Every participant is a price taker, perfect factor mobility, profit maximization of sellers, rational buyers, no externalities, zero transaction costs, and anti-competitive regulation. Branding directly influences the concepts of perfect information, homogeneous products, and rational buyers. Perfect information. When it comes to perfect information, this concept assumes that all buyers have access to the information they need to make a rational decision. The problem with this is that perfect information can't happen. It's just a premise economists build theories upon. It's a flawed premise to begin with since perfect information can't happen. Information takes time and energy to gather. This is basically labor and not all consumers are willing to do the labor needed to come to a rational decision. This is where branding subverts the theory of perfect competition. See, consumers become attached to brands based upon the branding and not the actual product. They don't have to do research on the product because they trust the brand. So when the brand comes out with any new product, they don't fully research it before committing to buy it. They know that that brand has certain qualities associated with it that they love and enjoy. In some cases, someone else might have information that they can't give. A company can hide information about their products. They can hide how many times it fails or how long its durability actually is. They can hide sales numbers from their investors. They can hide actual costs of production like slave labor or bad factory conditions in other countries. They can hide how toxic they may be to the people using it. Companies hide information and have done so in the past. Take Guidant Heart Defibrillators, for example. In 2002, Guidant discovered a potentially fatal design flaw in its defibrillators. It didn't issue a warning notice to doctors until 2005. Or Chiron's flu vaccine. In March 2014, executives at Chiron became aware of, an, of unexpectedly high levels of bacteria in the vaccine produced in Liverpool. The company waited 184 days and shipped a million doses of the flu vaccine before alerting the FDA. Or how about second chance body armor bulletproof vests? Executives knew, as early as 1998, that the material their vests were made of degraded substantially over time. In 2001, a Second Chance executive wrote in a memo that they immediately, that they immediately notify their customers. However, a memo from 2002 showed the president saying that they should continue to operate as if they have until one of their customers is killed or wounded. And people wonder why deregulation may be a bad thing. This type of stuff happens all the time. This is information being withheld from the consumer. It leads to consumers making bad choices based upon faulty information. Homogeneous products. These are identical goods and products offered in the market by competing suppliers. With perfect knowledge, buyers will regard the products as perfect substitutes for one and another and will have no preference for the product of a particular supplier. This results in all suppliers having no ability to charge other than a common price for their products. Fruits, vegetables, cotton swabs, grains, oils, and energy are all examples of these products. This is the battle between brand names and generic in most cases, like in the pharmaceutical industry. In contrast, a heterogeneous product is an item that cannot be easily substituted or replaced by others. They have distinct features that make them unique to certain brands or suppliers. 
They are designed to attract certain segments of the population and cater to people of varying geographical locations and socioeconomic status. Books, magazines, computers, and cell phones are examples of these. Rational Buyers A rational buyer is someone who exhibits rational behavior. Rational behavior is defined as the decision-making process that is based upon making choices that result in the optimal level of benefit or utility for an individual. Game theory is based completely off of this concept. The misconception is that a behavior is only rational when the individual seeks the highest return. It actually refers to the most optimal decision. This involves the amount of risk taken balanced with the reward and all the non-monetary gains, like developing trust between another person, gaining happiness, or setting oneself up for a better outcome in future problems. So, if a brand omits information to the buyer, then the buyer cannot make the most rational decision based upon knowing all information. They will make a rational decision based upon what they know, but that decision may turn out not to be the most optimal. They could buy their next TV based upon their experience with Samsung in the past and then come to find out that this particular TV was manufactured with a defect that caused the pixels to go out after 30 days. Or the whole Volkswagen debacle where they, lit, where they deliberately cheated emissions tests and produced up to 40 times more pollution than allowed. Side note, the former CEO Martin Winkerton walked away with a pension of over $28 million and denied having knowledge of the incident. Another high five to CEOs not taking responsibility for the bad that happens under their leadership. Branding in the poly economy. So what does branding have to do with the poly economy? The way our elections have evolved has led to the creation of two major parties, the GOP and the DNC. These are not just political parties, they are basically lifestyle brands at this point. Each politician is a brand promoter or an influencer. While every politician running in a party may not agree on every issue, the parties cast a wide enough net to encompass variations under their ring. These politicians then use the brand of the party to give voters a basic idea of things like their policies, their culture, their social values, and their personal beliefs. This not only helps them spend less money establishing some basic principles with voters, but also lets them ride on the coattails of the party's year-round work itself. Usually when a voter knows that an election is approaching, they look for one letter after the candidate's name. They look for that R or D to help them figure out quickly who is worth investing their time and support in. Now I'm not going to say our party system is perfect. There is a ton of valid criticisms to having only two major parties. However, at the same time, it does allow the collectivization of money and support to quickly flow across the country to where it is needed. Granted, our two-party system isn't codified in law anywhere. Other parties can run, and they do exist. The problem is that since they begin to specialize on their own issues, they cast a much smaller net. Since we do not have a parliamentary type system in which multiple parties are viable, these smaller parties have a hard time fundraising and getting candidates to run. If you run as a libertarian and lose, well maybe you just had to run as a republican and you would have won. When you think about the GOP, what comes to mind? What specific things are they known for? To me, the GOP stands for tradition, nationalism, social values tied to religious interpretation, business, individualism, big government in areas of culture and national security, and the current house for the biggest conservative element. Conservatism itself isn't a left or right idea. It's about the right, the rate of change or appeal to a tradition. The DNC has conservative elements. They just don't call themselves that anymore. They are more known as establishment Democrats. When you think about the DNC, what comes to mind? What specific things are they known for? To me, the DNC stands for workers' rights, equality in the eyes of the law, social justice, progressive values, and big government in the realm of fixing the ills of capitalism. More generally, it's home to the ideas that I advocate for. However, that doesn't mean I am a DNC shill either. It is its own element and will fight to make sure that it stays relevant regardless of changing times. People have a general idea about what each party's platform is based upon the brand that they've built. 
This also means people have misconceptions about each party as well. Not only do the major parties fight to build their own brand, they actively build a proxy brand of their competitor. Each side has a general conception of the other party that is mostly informed by their chosen party's rhetoric. The GOP sees the DNC as the party of the social justice warriors, where emotions drive policies instead of cold, hard facts. While the DNC sees the GOP as the party of stupid, uneducated, poor people hoping they will be rich one day. While there might be some merit in these statements, they are just trying to attack the brand of the party. They try to frame an issue by the opposition in a way that it is a win for their brand. Like how entities, entities switch their tactics once their politicians get elected to running smear campaigns against their opponents. Branding also sets up a sort of tribalism within the poly economy. Tribalism has many definitions, but the one I want to work with revolves around the idea that members in a particular social group are extremely loyal to that group. Take the GOP and DNC for example. Many diehard fans of each party will vote for their front runner no matter what. Let's look at Roy Moore for example. He barely lost his race against Doug Jones. 670,551 to 649,240 votes. Why is this significant? Well, Roy Moore was removed from his position as Chief Justice of Alabama Supreme Court by defying a federal U.S. Judge Myron Thompson's ruling. According to Judge Thompson, if all Chief Justice Moore had done were to emphasize the Ten Commandments' historical and educational importance, or their importance as a model code for good citizenship, this court would have a much different case before it. But the Chief Justice did not limit himself to this. He went far, far beyond. He installed a two and a half ton monument in the most prominent place in a government building, managed with dollars from all state taxpayers, with the specific purpose and effect of establishing a permanent recognition of the sovereignty of God, the Judeo-Christian God, Overall, citizens in this country, regardless of each taxpaying citizen's individual personal beliefs or lack thereof. To this, the Establishment Clause says no. Moore intentionally defied the judge's order and was removed from office by the Alabama Court of the Judiciary on November 12, 2003. Moore was then re-elected in 2012 to the same position. On January 28, 2015, the Southern Poverty Law Center filed a judicial ethics complaint against Moore stating that he publicly commented on pending same-sex marriage cases and encouraged state officials and judges to ignore the federal court ruling overturning same-sex marriage. On May 6, 2016, the Alabama Judicial Inquiry Commission forwarded a list of six charges of ethical violations to the Alabama Court of the Judiciary. He was immediately suspended from the court pending the trial and ruling. The six complaints were as follows. Disregarding a federal injunction, demonstrated unwillingness to follow clear law, abuse of administrative authority, substituting his judgment for the judgment of the entire Alabama Supreme Court, including failure to abstain from public comment about a pending proceeding in his own court, interference with legal process and remedies in the United States District Court and or Alabama Supreme Court related to proceedings in which Alabama probate judges were involved, and finally, failure to recuse himself from pending proceedings in the Alabama Supreme Court after making public comment and placing his impartiality into question. After numerous appeals, Moore finally resigned and announced he would be running for the United States Senate. That November 9th, women came forth with alleged sexual misconduct allegations. This caused many national Republicans to call for him to drop out. He didn't, and a week before the election, Trump strongly endorsed him. Who would have thought? And particularly pedophiles secrete an enzyme for DDHT, which is actually detectable. It is three times the level of non-perverts. Because uh, neither of us are sex offenders, then it makes absolutely nothing. You just put it on, you put it nearby. Wait, this, this is obviously a problem, hold on. Hold on. It must be faulty. 
It's malfunctioning. I'm sure it will do the same with the other guy here. Uh, Hezi? Yeah. Let me just take it. More lost with 1% less votes. Think about that. The GOP says it's the party of law and order and of traditional family values, but voted for a man who was removed from public office twice and had nine allegations of sexual misconduct against him. How is this possible? The only thing I can think of is the tribalism built around the GOP's brand. The parties and lifestyle branding. What is a lifestyle brand? A lifestyle brand is a brand that attempts to embody the values, aspirations, interests, attitudes, or opinions of a group or a culture for marketing purposes. Lifestyle brands seek to inspire, guide, and motivate people with the goal of their products contributing to the definition of the consumer's way of life. How does lifestyle branding correlate to politics? With the polyconomy, parties themselves are trying to sell themselves to consumers or voters. These parties have latched on to deep cultural and social values of large swaths of the American public. They've created a brand that automatically gives a voter a sense of deep belonging to a larger group of people who share deeply held beliefs with one another. While there may be only a handful for each party, these central issues are what really binds them together. They have become this rally cry. For example, Usually when you see a conservative running for a position, they always put proud conservative, small government, pro-life, or pro-second amendment on their election material. These are the common cultural aspects that binds most of the right together. These talking points are rallying cries of deeply held beliefs. On the left, it's usually along the lines of pro-choice, minority rights, and helping the less off through government means. I am a Bernie Sanders supporter, and I have major disagreements with many Democrats on policies, but the Democrat brand is something we can at least rally under. And let me be clear, I'm not a party shield either. I understand that maybe a Democrat may not be the best for a, for a particular area or policy event. However, over, with the Overton window in America shifting more and more towards the right, it's harder to find a Republican who isn't past the threshold of being moderate. This lifestyle branding makes it even harder to win over support from the other side. When the brand becomes a part of the individual's identity, policy discussion is out of the question. Politics has almost become as toxic as talking about religion. It's hard to attack an individual's religious ideas without seeming like you're making a personal attack. The same has come true for politics. It's getting increasingly difficult to talk policy positions than just throwing about ad hominems like libtard or fascist. We default to attacking the character of the other person instead of the actual policy points. Or when do we speak of policy points? They're not really points, but opinions based upon our worldview. For example, the topic of the often referred to phrase common sense. The phrase itself is the talking point and not the actual policy one is referring to. When asked about that policy, they just reply, it's common sense, as if that is an answer. They have no real reason to hold that opinion beyond it just feels right. I'm not bashing feelings as emotions, but as this decision-making compass, I can feel I am making the right decision, or I can research and make sure that I am, which is better. Market influences on the poly economy. No, I am not talking about your favorite brand promoter. I'm talking about how the market influences the ideas and conversations about politics within the poly economy. One of the biggest ones I can think of is the media. However, the media itself is being hit by market influences as well. Just as in Jenga, when you continuously remove blocks and weaken the base, eventually the whole tower will fall. The media really isn't the culprit though, it's our consumption habits. Let me explain. Since the invention of the internet and the technological advancements of cell phones, information is just a finger swipe away. One can pick up their phone right now and search for anything their heart desires. With the introduction of 5G, the world of interconnectivity is going to explode. Now, add the success of Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube, 
and we have redefined the lanes in which information is distributive. It's no longer held behind traditional media sources that vet information and cultivate a measured response to events. It has given birth to the rise of alternative media, which isn't necessarily bad. It depends on who that media intends to serve. If it's just going to stoke conspiracy stories and fear in the population in order to create and gain capital, then it's bad. But if it's there to offer a counter-narrative to the benefit of the public, then it's great. Organizations like InfoWars and Breitbart serve to push a political agenda. In PBS's frontline documentary, America's Great Divide, the website Breitbart has used to help push narratives that serve only to stoke political action. These narratives didn't have to be true, but they needed them in order to accomplish their political agenda. Steve Bannon used Breitbart to help put Trump into power. They ran articles that helped push a carefully crafted narrative that would lead to Trump's rise in power. The outcome was to make sure Trump won, not to make sure the public was adequately informed to make the, de the best decision. They used the market's failures to produce perfect information and flooded it with so much bullshit that no one could pick out truth from fiction on the right. Couple that with speaking directly to their audience's bias, they created a propaganda machine under the guise of news. Couple all this with the decrease in TV revenue and the market has begun to create an environment which infotainment becomes the new norm in how we consume media. News is no longer about presenting the facts, but creating some type of entertainment to keep viewers engaged. This technique is useful when it's used sparingly. However, in a world where we have breaking news 24-7, it has become the standard. Alternative media outlets have used this blurring of facts and entertainment and the overuse of that technique to keep customers engaged and to increase the likelihood of their content being shared. The market has produced an environment in which facts can be alternative and subjective to one's world's view. It has created two entirely different realities of life in America. But something else may have contributed to our current political climate. Introducing more free market principles into the broadcasting world. How? The FCC Fairness Doctrine Rule. For over 30 years, the Federal Communications Division required broadcast licenses to present controversial issues of public importance and to do so in a manner that was fair and balanced. The FCC is charged with an expansive mandate to ensure that broadcast stations operate in the public interest. The Fairness Doctrine Rule consisted of two basic components. One, that every licensee devote a reasonable portion of broadcast time to discussion and consideration of controversial issues of public importance, and two, that in doing so, the broadcaster must be fair, that is, the broadcaster must affirmatively endeavor to make facilities available for the expression of contrasting viewpoints held by responsible elements with respect to the controversial issues presented. In order to satisfy these obligations, one had to do more than just grant airtime to those who requested it in order to respond to an issue previously discussed. They had the affirmative duty to determine the appropriate opposing viewpoints where and who was best suited to present them. If sponsored programming was not an option, the broadcasters had to provide it at their own expense. More requirements were eventually regulated with the addition of the personal attack rule. It stated that whenever a personal attack was made, that the broadcaster had one week to notify the person they attacked, provide them with a copy of the broadcast, and allow them an opportunity to respond over the broadcaster's facilities. Furthermore, the political editorial rule required that when a broadcaster endorsed a particular political candidate, they had to provide other qualified candidates for the same office the opportunity to respond over the broadcaster's facilities. Under the enforcement aspect, the FCC would look for whether or not the licensee had acted reasonably and in good faith to present a fair cross-section of opinion on the controversial issue. They emphasized that harmless errors and honest mistakes were not actionable, and that the merits of any competing viewpoint were not under review. In 1985, the FCC chairman, Mark S. Fowler, released a report stating that the doctrine hurt the public interest and violated free speech rights guaranteed by the First Amendment. In a 4-0 vote, the FCC abolished the doctrine under FCC chairman Dennis R. Patrick in 1987. 
This decision was upheld by DC's appeals court in which they made the determination without ever reaching the constitutional issue. The FCC itself said, The intrusion by government into the content of programming occasioned by the enforcement of the Fairness Doctrine restricts the journalistic freedom of broadcasters and actually inhibits the presentation of controversial issues of public importance to the detriment of the public and the degradation of the editorial prerogative of broadcast journalists. Congress viewed this decision as the FCC trying to flout the will of Congress and that it was wrongheaded, misguided, and illogical. In June 1987, Congress tried to codify the Fairness Doctrine, but Ronald Reagan and later George H.W. Bush stopped it. Republicans for the win. One could say that since the revocation of the Fairness Doctrine, that it has given rise to media outlets that produce biased reporting as truth, both on the right and left. Now that the internet has decentralized the ability for one to acquire knowledge, misinformation and opinions disguised as facts can easily spread and mobilize voting blocks in this country. Since media organizations are not forced to provide a fair representation of the other side, Rhetoric and narrative can be crafted without question. These outlets create media bubbles that in return create bubbles around their viewers in the form of echo chambers. I believe this has led to many people not being able to effectively argue their positions without being openly hostile. They don't know how to counter a valid point that attacks the very base of the premise of their argument. They're not used to being challenged, but just people stepping in line and nodding their heads to the talking points I heard on Fox News or whatever. The future of the poly economy. Just like now, how people are complacent or just don't understand how their individual will is subverted through advertising and marketing, the poly economy seems to be on the same path. What do I mean? Well, let's take a look at the most recent example of the COVID stimulus package. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why this money is being spent and the importance of it to our economy. However, so are other programs aimed at reducing the individual economic burden on, the, in, on individuals that help them unlock their earning potential, like Medicare for All or Free Public College. We just passed a $2 trillion stimulus package out of thin air. I heard no conversations about how we're going to pay for it or how this will affect our current budget. Yet, when we talk about spending billions on public education, suddenly we don't have any money and we must cut social spending. There is a major difference that I'm willing to admit, though. The COVID problem directly affects the entire economy, while the other programs only affect a small portion of it. Or it could just be that since the problem is dir uh, directly affecting their own pocketbook, now it's something we should use big government for. Regardless of the reason, the media helped shape the conversation about the subject for two different sides. The right focused on the small business owner that needed to shut their doors due to government regulation, while the left focused on businesses letting go of workers or cutting their hours, which leads, leads to missed payments or no income for food. Both sides acknowledge that the economy must keep moving. Money must keep circulating. But where they differ is who makes those wheels turn. The right screams, who is John Galt, while the left screams, worker use, workers unite, for the most part. If we continue to allow the market to influence our politics, we will be on a path that will lead to the destruction of our social and cultural norms. The market will continue to influence the individual through the science of advertising, which will in return influence the political sphere. Not to mention that a free market can only exist in theory since perfect information is impossible to obtain. The one thing that tried to present perfect information, the Fairness Doctrine, has been tossed out the window. It is imperative that we protect our public institutions from the influence of the invisible hand, and most importantly, profits. We need to make sure that they serve the interest of all American citizens, and not just a few. Our political system is inherently neutral towards the public good. There is no one lobbying for our collective interest or fighting against leg legislation that will hurt it. Our vote is the only lobbying we get. Well, I hope you guys liked the video. Uh, it took a couple months for me to get this written down and to make it because it was really a new theory I wanted to put out there and, and, and start a conversation on. 
But uh, hopefully it was good and y'all understand it. If you have any questions, comments, whatever, leave them below. Contact me on Twitter. I use that a lot. And uh, y'all just have a great day. And thanks for everything. And be safe.